Up next, we have the rising trend of luxury hotel residences. Our, moder <clears throat> Our moderator is Gloria Fu, who is an independent board director for Appreciate. So welcome to the stage. I was quick, sorry. No. Oh, here we go. <laughs> well, anyway, hi, I'm Gloria Fu. Um, I'm the chair of the East Coast chapter of the ILHA, and I'm also an independent board member for Appreciate, which is a single family residential rental management company, so a lot lower than branded luxury. Um, I was previously a portfolio manager at JP Morgan, where we managed 25 billion in mutual fund assets, and we were frequently top shareholders of Marriott <laughs> and Hilton and some other uh, REITs. Um, I also live part-time at the W Residences in Austin, so I feel very qualified because I'm very familiar with the ease, the convenience, and the amazing services offered as a luxury resident. So um, with that, I'd love uh, my esteemed panelists to introduce themselves. And I'll start with Sarah, who I thank for being at Marriott and for the W residences to be exi in existence. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Khalifa, and I'm vice president of mixed use development for Marriott International. So I oversee any residential projects across our brands in North America, Caribbean, and South America. So really any of those new projects which are located with a hotel or standalones really run through me and my team. Good morning. Siva Selman, I work for Long and Foster Commercial Division, uh, which is the affiliate of uh, Berkshire Hathaway uh, based in Washington, DC. We are also affiliate of uh, Global uh, Luxury Properties. Um, Previous to my commercial um, engagement, I worked in the hotel space for 25 years. Last 15 years was the four seasons. I uh, would like to share some of the residential lesson learns uh, to share with this group. Now that I'm on the asset side and working with the owners and high net worth customers uh, to buy those residential units in beautiful properties where uh, these folks are building, I uh, would like to share. and. Um, Thank you for ILHA giving the opportunity for us to share the best practices. Great. Thanks, Siva. Hi, I'm Peter Bazzelli. I'm principal of Weitzman. Uh, we're a New York-based development and investment advisory firm. Uh, we consult on about 300 projects um, every year throughout North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Probably about 50 of those are branded residential and really five-star resort uh, or hotel properties. And so these are in urban and resort locations um, all throughout our region. And um, you know, we, our work always starts with market research and financial feasibility testing of the concept. But oftentimes, we're brought on to continue to join on the, the actual execution of the development. And so it's that practical understanding that I think um, you know, gives us sort of a unique point of view on the trends that we're here to talk about today. So I'm very pleased to be with you. Thanks. Thanks so much. So um, luxury branded residential is not a new concept. So we have like really iconic stories like Eloise who lived in the plaza and then General MacArthur's widow who lived in the Waldorf Towers. And Peter and I were talking about this backstage. He's like, did you work at the Waldorf Towers? I said, no, I was at the Waldorf and General MacArthur's wife, should we kind of like parade around the right around the clock? And um, she apparently lived there for another 10 years after I left and that I was in my early 20s. Um, Anyway, branded lux luxury residential has, is not a new concept to gateway cities. Sarah, I'm curious, today though, what's driving this explosion of branded residences to include some more traditional hotel brands as well as other luxury brands? 
I think it's a mix of things. I think certainly COVID probably accelerated um, this, this trend, but I think more and more we're looking at how we live differently. Um, I think when we go stay as a guest at a hotel, we want to feel at home. And then when we come home, we want to feel like we're away. And so I think COVID, just spending more time in our homes, has probably accelerated that, that notion. And we're just becoming more discerning, just as guests, when we go choose our next vacation or business trip, the same in, in our living. So that's kind of where the, the brands and kind of the story behind the brands and the history and the glamour, I think that kind of is just like a natural synergy um, in terms of brands plus luxury real estate. Um, but, but I think it's only set to, to grow in, in the next couple of years, but certainly COVID probably <laughs> accelerated that. And then Siva, like what are you seeing as far as like your client base and you know, what are they looking for in, in that vein? Sure, I think the, if I wear the, so I'm kind of wearing two hats here, if I wear the hotel hat, private residences give you a very quick return. So I give, I give you an example of a property I was working with my previous world by the time we sold the 31st private residence, the land was paid off before we put the shovel on the ground. So that developer was definitely able to do that before we even put the logo on the building. So that's number one, there is the opportunity for underwriting, it's easier to get those projects going. Number two, the branded residents have been in the market for plus 20 plus years, but as Sarah said, this COVID has accelerated. People said, hey, I can live and work from anywhere. So people went and said, I would like to get all the amenities from the hotel while I can work. So that's really uh, uh, excelled the projects on uh, where the resort, urban markets, uh, major markets, it doesn't matter. So we, from the development side, you can hear that we're getting more of more properties coming in different markets because of the reason, because it started off the resorts, but now it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Can I add one little thing? Sure. I mean, Siva kind of touched on it, but a lot of the the projects, especially in the luxury space, any hotel project more and more will have a mixed use component for specifically residential. And so what we're seeing at Marriott um, is certainly 80 plus percent of any luxury project will have some residential component. Exactly like you said, because for a sponsor, mm -hmm. it's, it's certainly more attractive having deposits and yep. funds coming in and certainly to the lenders as well. So yep. kind of. And then, it, you know, since, since we're on this topic, like, how are you kind of deciding? Like, obviously, you know, there's a finite piece of land, and usually it's like some kind of condo development. And, you know, the simplistic part is, oh, yeah, well, the, the views go to the people who are going to be living there. And then, you know, I'm a business traveler. I, you know, JP Morgan's going to just pay what they're going to pay. So how are you guys kind of deciding on the, these mixes? It's really market driven. <laughs> um, every market is, is really unique and different. So um, we, you're right. We, we want to balance the guest's experience versus the buyer's um, experience. So it's, I would say we're completely, it's, it's a market based um, solution for us. And then, um, you know, I think Peter that you, since you're more in on the ground, ground up development, um, can things shift? Like, let's say the pre-sales go so well, like, oh, you know, maybe we should switch floors or, you know, how, how what's the kind of like background secret sauce in that area? Well, hopefully, you know, to Sarah's point, you've conducted great market research to begin with and you've really vetted the development concepts to make sure that what you're thinking about doing is actually going to resonate with the market, that you've understood what the precedents are and carved out a niche for the project so that it can actually be singular, one-of-a-kind in its own competitive market, um, which increases its chances of success. But if you find yourself in the middle of construction or design, you know, and the market changes and we're in a kind of volatile period right now, um, you know, there, there always is the potential to make a change, but of course it can be extremely costly. It can delay the project. Um, it can, you know, negatively impact returns to do that. But the choice might be so stark that you have to make that choice because otherwise you end up with an unmarketable development um, that, that's not well received at all by the product, so the, by the market. So if you have to make a change that may be costly or cause delays, um, that still may be better than having a, a project that goes under. 
And are we starting to see any of that yet? You know, the great, <laughs> the great <laughs> news is that I think, you know, um, a branded residential and the types of five-star hospitality projects that we're speaking about um, have an element of recession resistance, if not recession proof uh, to them. And so despite the volatility of the current market, the projects that I'm working on are, are performing exceedingly well. Okay. Well, Peter, um, just continuing on this vein, so we historically we saw a lot of the locations of branded residential and you know, either gateway cities or we saw them in like vacation destinations. I sometimes live in Park City as well and there's a <laughs> lot of branded residential there. Um, but today we're seeing this proliferation where it's not quite gateway cities. We got, you know, Austin where I live at the W and then there's a Four Seasons um, in various locations, uh, Ritz-Carlton, Fort Lauderdale. Um, and, and then I think you've said there are some suburban projects that are kind of taking off in Westchester. Um, can, can we just delve into this that's so like, you know, the home versus a destination vacation? And then your, you know, maybe your thoughts on a hotel component versus standalone. For me? Yeah. Um, well, you know, there is never, there's never really been a time when um, branded residential and hospitality has been finding its way into new and unique markets. And, and so it's really an exciting time for the way that, that you know, people who are living in some of these tertiary markets have an opportunity to live in this serviced lifestyle. Um, and so that's really where the growth is happening these days, um, is serving populations in smaller markets like St. Louis and Pensacola, Florida, and you know, um, you know, Texas is a huge, huge growth market. You know, South Florida has been, of course, um, you know, uh, the focus of branded residential and hospitality um, serviced residential development for a long time. But, you know, these trends are really uh, continuing to accelerate because there's such a demand for, um, you know, the stamp of approval and the security that you can feel that you have when you purchase a branded residence because the brand stands behind your residential experience. And so whether that is in a smaller market or a large market, the, um, the sort of you know, blue chip investment aspect of, of that type of purchase um, really resonates with the market. And of course, there are wealthy people and affluent people all over. And so it's not just the big cities where this is happening anymore. And then I, I'd just be curious, because this, when you talk about blue chip, then Sarah, I'm thinking, Okay, Marriott, you guys have, you know, anywhere from like 20 year management contracts. I know Four Seasons tends to be longer. What if things go awry with the hotel and, you know, it's like we're not really wanting to have our Ritz-Carlton flag now, but it's a Ritz-Carlton residence. How do we kind of balance that and, you know, are you guys obligated as a brand flag to keep that hotel whatever brand it is? Uh, yes and no. Um, you know, once, of course, the developer has sold out and he's had a great success, the HOA takes over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we as Marriott or as Rose Carlton or St. Regis, we will manage the HOA. Now, those HOAs are, are quite, we are employees or stewards or servants of the HOA. And the HOA's wants and needs are very important. You know, oftentimes they don't want to have to deflag you know their asset is very much tied into the brand and what the brand delivers and and, and the service so we it, it's a delicate balance we never had to have such um, that kind of an exit but it is it is something that yeah we have to recognize that as certain assets are aging how do we you know have this delicate balance of hotel and the residential and the HOA how do we balance that so thus far <laughs> we're the it sounds like the industry is still nascent <laughs> enough that it's not <laughs> happened, but it could happen. And then, um, Suva, <laughs> given the fact that you represent owners more, I'm just kind of curious, you know, is that a concern on your owner's um, front? And then, you know, what's their thoughts on income when they're going into this? Because as you said, quick return. Yeah, so the re residential owners are looking at uh, the value. So, for example, if a brand we buy for $9,000 per square foot, those are ultra-luxury properties, and they're buying because of that logo on that building. So that's Sarah's point, you know, sits with the HOA, the governance, and so forth. So the, the buyers are very, they are very laser-focused of where they want to put that investment. 
And I find those buyers, if they buy it on one location, they would like to buy it when the brand goes and put it in another location. I'm representing four season buyers. Uh, they're on wait list in certain markets, and they are, you know, the developers are kind of using this as a, uh, you know, you've got to register them, you need to know who they are, and can you show me the financial statement? So there is a huge uh, uh, lineup for a ramp up for that type of, but they are just buying it because the logo on the building. Mm -hmm. And because then what I, about location there? Location, definitely the waterfront is the biggest driver. Uh, but recently I did transactions such as New York. Um, I was able to get uh, investors to buy where I could return a cap rate up for almost you operating a hotel at an eight cap. So even urban hotels, if you get the right market, there is an opportunity to uh, give that owner a good return on investment. And then I, I guess I'd just kind of open up to all of you guys on the HOA front. Um, you know, what, what is the general kind of mix of, you know, this HOA will allow you to put the, the property in a rental pool versus, no, this is a residence only. And, you know, if you don't have like someone staying here for six months, no Airbnb, whatever, you know, what, what's that kind of balance and, and how can things change? if, you know, several years down the road, you have more permanent people? You want to go first? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> you have a lot of opinions, I'm sure. Let's yeah. do this. A little controversial. <laughs> There's kind of two lanes, let's say. So there's those residences that are co-located with the hotel. Mm -hmm. And you're right, that offering, certainly in the resort markets, there will be an optional rental program where a buyer of a residence has the opportunity to to put their residence or condo or villa into the hotel inventory and have the hotel manage it and rent it on their behalf. They have owner usage rights, certain weeks, and there's a certain split that the, that owner and the manager of the, of the hotel end up kind of agreeing to. Then there's a standalone model, which is just, you know, residential, HOA or, or build, usually it's a tower to be frank, and it's without, it doesn't have a hotel located next door. And so kind of the rules of engagement are, are kind of different for each of these projects. And the lanes, the swim lanes are different. So certainly someone that's buying to look to put their, their unit into a rental program is not in, incentivized to buy in a standalone mm -hmm. because there is no opportunity to put your unit in a rental program without the hotel. So it's kind of almost a little bit different lanes, different thinking caps. But, you know, in a long term, if someone's looking to really a long term stay where they don't want their, you know, to be in the elevator exactly with VRBO or Airbnb or short term guests, they're likely to go in the latter, right? Into the standalone where it's usually it's a minimum rental period of six months. Exactly right. So it's just, it kind of, it's the preference. There's a lot of people that prefer that kind of sense of security. The costs are higher when you allow for short-term rentals. So, you know, there are some um, HOAs that have really pushed out. It's a our market, we want to be able to rent for 90 days. It sounds like a long time, but the, the, the wear and tear on those common areas is quite expensive. Mm -hmm. And so those that aren't doing that, um, it, it's kind of maybe a, an idea of fairness, yeah. but it's kind of just two different um, workouts or programs for just the different buyer and how they're intending on using their asset. You know, for the most part, these are secondary, tertiary, fourth homes, mm -hmm. you know, and so the kind of it depends on how the buyer is looking to use it. Right. And I think also, you know, the option for a rental rental pool uh, participation is really mostly in resort locations, not really in urban centers where there's a much greater likelihood that the other residents in the, in the building are using it as a primary or among their primary homes. And so, you know, especially in resort locations, you know, you can really drive price um, significantly higher by offering the ability to enroll your unit in the hotel rental pool um, because of the idea that, you know, most people buying these envision themselves using the, the home for 30 days a year, 90 days, whatever it is, maybe even up to six months. But the idea that there's a cash flow aspect to that investment that mitigates their cost of ownership, where they can own the thing for free, maybe for $10,000 a year, and you know, God bless if they can actually earn a return, 
uh, and then still use it themselves, that's a fantastic way to merchandise real estate. And so, you know, in all of the resort locations where, where we're working, that's, that's now the model of choice. Condo hotels were popular for a while, and those have really fallen out of favor because of the fact that most developers see that the path to higher pricing and bigger sellouts is with this rental pool option where they can do it. But in New York City, you really can't. And so there we're relying much more on the service mentality and what are we, what are we doing in the competitive market that's really unique for that branded residential offering, if there's a hotel there or if, or if there's not. And that's really driven then by the exclusivity and the anticipatory service that these types of projects provide to their residents. And so weaving a marketing narrative around what the real value add is for the buyers, realizing that they're, they're not going to be doing short-term rentals, that it's their lifestyle, and that's what they're investing in. It's not a cash flow aspect. Um, and so the, the models are very, very different depending upon where you're, where you're focusing your development attention. And Peter, you, you, you mentioned New York City, and then I just, as a former resident, I seem to have lived everywhere, even though I felt like I lived my whole adult life in New York, um, HOA, yeah. and common <laughs> area maintenance. Yes. And let's just talk about how much more expensive it is to actually live in branded luxury residential, and that, you know, your local New York buyer, what are they thinking, and, mm -hmm. you know, other locations would sure. be similar. Well, in New York, it's, it's really the most expensive market in the domestic US to operate a branded residential because the brand standards for five-star flags are really high. And so the payroll, which is always sort of the most significant expense to any condominium association, tends to be really, really high in New York super luxury buildings. Um, and then, of course, usually there's a contribution from the residential association to the hotel to provide the access for residents to access hotel amenities. And so for hotel branded and serviced condominiums in New York City, we could see maintenance fees that are $3 per square foot per month, up to $5 per square foot per month, plus real estate taxes. And uh, it really depends on the scale of the project. So you know, I've worked for the last eight years in the redevelopment of the Waldorf on Park Avenue. And our residential sellout there with 372 units is 615,000 square feet. So we can have the highest level of service and have it be a competitive advantage for us because our maintenance fees are lower on a per square foot basis because we're amortizing that cost over a huge building. Now you compare that with a 20 unit building that's trying to provide the same level of service, it's exorbitantly expensive. So the messaging around what the value add is for those buyers of those 20 units has got to be totally on point, well thought through, very clear that you can't find this residential product anywhere else and it's worth every penny for you to live here. And so when the pressure is on related to maintenance fees, really wherever you're developing, um, it really becomes so much more important to have a really clear, differentiated marketing message. And then how much, um, you know, as we're structuring it from the beginning on the HOA, you know, there, at least the, the W, and you know, there's a lot of people that complain, and I've been to enough of these meetings to hear it, that they feel that sometimes the people who are stretching to buy into these units, they feel like they've been jammed with the HOA. So ha let's just talk about structure, because obviously, if I were the hotel, I'd want the resident to take as much of the HOA as possible. Disclosure. <laughs> Disclosure. <laughs> Disclosure. As, as, yeah. Um, I think I think that's yeah. It is is it's exciting to be a part, and I think you're right. You're kind of almost capturing. There's an allure and excitement um, to to be able, and it's kind of a sense of like you've made it or arrived. And talk, I'm thinking of Austin because I used to be an Austinite, <laughs> and I know what that means for a lot of like these young professionals. Yep. And came in through the back door. <laughs> But it's, it's so, but, but there is, I think for us, when we look at HOA costs, it doesn't, as a brand, it may be easy to say these are all our requirements and these are all the amenities and, and this kind of lifts our brand. But, it, but in reality, we're, we are tied in with the developer. If you are not selling, and the first question any buyer will ask is what's the HOA? Yes. We, we are <laughs> shooting ourselves in the foot if we have, if we have required all these programming and amenities and services and FTEs, it, we're, we're triple or even double or one and a half times the market. Mm -hmm. It doesn't serve us well as a brand. We have something that's not sellable or not digestible by, by, by the buyers. And it does, so it doesn't benefit also 
clearly the development, and there's a struggle in sales. So I think we have to be kind of agile in both ways. We have to see what is really going to bring us the most bang for our buck. And certainly, we see certain amenities, you will earn certain premiums just by a certain key touch points yes. of amenities. And I think you're getting the right magic and mix and making sure that we can turn it into a premium. Certainly, the brand provides a premium, but, cer but definitely the programming does as well. And then balancing it with the number of residences versus exclusivity. Yep. I mean, it is really kind of this magic. Uh, yeah, it, it, every, every project is going to be different. So it's hard to say this yeah. one size fits no, all. No, and I, th I think your point about amenities is important because you know, the cost of the association is always how much does it cost for me to staff the amenities. It's the developer that bears the upfront cost related to building them. But then if you've got to operate them, that's the burden on the owners. And so you know, the value has got to still be tied to the brand related to the service provision of the people who work there, the people who activate, program, and you know, make vibrant this lifestyle that you've bought into. And that's, that's where the expense comes in for 20 years, 30 years. So in our planning session, I think you used the word recession proof, and I like almost had a heart <laughs> attack and said, recession resistant. Right, <laughs> so right. can we talk more about this recession resistant aspect of these branded um, residential units and, and, and also the, this, you know, the HOA mixing in costs going up? Um, I'd, I'd be curious to hear all your thoughts, and maybe, Siva, we could start with you. Um, I can tell you that in 2021, um, our company did um, 36 billion on transactions. Uh, but I, we, when you dive into the data, most of them uh, people are buying up than what they could afford. But the interest rate was one of the piece. Mm -hmm. And we also saw a, a large number of cash buyers too. Because they've, everybody knows what's going on with the stock side. Mm -hmm. So they're able to get a good return on investments. For example, if you buy a property uh, on a, I'll give you an example, on a Four Seasons uh, flag property, you could make up your capital under 12 years. So there is a very good return on investment based on you pick up a right uh, asset, right uh, size, um, and the right um, uh, um, location as well. So. So people are putting money out of it, and that's why I represent a couple of private equity groups. Um, I pitch them with various projects to them to see which one they have appetite. You know, there are a lot of questions. They are all CPAs. Uh, but I put together a, a modeling for them because I worked in the hotel. I oversaw Four Seasons Resorts. I know a property uh, with a four-bedroom villa in a resort per night, how much they sell. So if I give that owner that villa, on a monthly basis, I'm talking quarter million dollars to half a million dollars a month. These are properties where people are on wait list to book a villa for an overnight stay. So when we present this uh, modeling, it's not a financial guarantee. You know, as a, we have licensed brokers, we can't give guarantees. But what we provide is the value. So that'll, that's where the developer, mm -hmm. you know, work with us and say, hey, you know, bring on. Uh, we would like to talk to your investors. Uh, but these are not big group, they are individuals. So we, we definitely see that it's continually going despite of where the interest rates are today. I'll tease Sarah up a little bit because Marriott's never had a stronger branded residential business. And a lot of your growth had been during some of the tougher economic years that we've seen in the last decade, uh, where it's been booming. And the truth, the reality is that the rich are getting richer. And despite the market being down despite you know, you know, economic uncertainty to some degree, there's a lot of money out there. And so these families, these households that want to live in a hotel service lifestyle, it's not really a question for them whether they can afford it or whether they have, are a little less rich today than they were yesterday. It's about buying into the security that a branded residential offering provides. And so that's, I think, why we're seeing so much growth and why I, I say it's recession-proof, because you can sell a really well-conceived branded residential development, hotel service residential development, uh, and as well as it, uh, as well as it um, you know, is, is planned and developed, you can sell it even in the worst market. So uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic about this product type. Sarah? I think it was kind of an influx of both things. Yes, certainly cash buyers play a component at this certain tier, the luxury tier. 
but also there, there were certain trends that were already happening, right? I can think like the, the downsizing or right sizing. So many communities in, in w which we're doing projects, you know, whether it's Estero Bay or Naples or whatever, they're, they're used to, you know, $7,000, you know, $7 square foot, um, 7000 I don't want to say dollar because that's all. So, I was right, surprised for big, square foot. Not seven thousand. But huge estates. Right. Let's just say that, and they want to stay in their communities, and they want to not downsize, but like right size. They want to still be connected to, you know, go to the club, mm -hmm. have their friends, their family is still there, have their grandkids. So that's a lot. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a generational right point that people are. Had, they're getting rid of these estates yes. that they had and these large homes, and this is a smart buy for them. Yes. Mm -hmm. They have the cash. But, so I think it's a mixture. I think it depends on, you're right, the, the right place, but it's also a, a timing issue, baby boomers, right yeah. sizing. Just one more comment to that, though, because I think one trend we're seeing with branded residential is that you know, there are developments that are literally in the middle of nowhere that are achieving great sales success <laughs> because they're able to <laughs> tap into... Boomer. This yep. idea that because the brand is standing behind it, I can be secure in my expectations for the lifestyle and the investment aspects in terms of appreciation, mm -hmm. the protection of my capital. Um, and so, you know, when you're starting to think about even in a down market investing several million dollars or more in a second home, um, at least when you have branded residential behind you, you know that there's a stamp of approval from an organization that has a track record of doing it well. So in lieu of like, you know, to your point about downsizing, so you used to have the seven to 10,000 square foot house that maybe had a few hundred thousand dollars of landscaping costs a year. Right. So right. you kind of have traded that off for huge HOA, like 250,000. What are these like must have amenities that you guys think are the make or break of like, you know, beyond like, yeah, it's beautiful, it's Four Seasons, it's maybe Ritz, but, and on the water, but you know, there's other intangibles that I think are really important for these would-be buyers, because there aren't, there are a lot of them, but there aren't that many of them. Yeah, it's, I think it's very interesting. Uh, we, we provide a lot of services uh, to residents as customers, but the residents customer will ask for something not on the list. <laughs> oh, they want someone to come and unpack the bags in their room. They might want to order whole food and deliver before they arrive. So I think the call out for the hoteliers is, you know, there's a huge opportunity to tap into r revenue because that's a revenue stream. Uh, you know, they are willing to pay for it. But I think uh, answering Gloria's question is, just a gym and a welcome um, doorman and bellman doesn't cut it, right? That's what we think is amenity. I think these customers are looking for almost like 24-7 support for any, any needs they need inside. Uh, that's including, you know, maybe a butler available on call. They would like to pay $250 an hour if they have to. But the hotels are not able to provide that in, in the time they need it. Uh, so I think I would definitely urge to look at the amenities, what we provide for uh, these customers, because their request is, I want my uh, chef to come and cook uh, um, a hamburger in my lanai in my resort. Those are the requests they are looking for. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, would, I would add that there's also the desire for exclusively private residential spaces and amenities so that they always have the choice, and there's the greatest luxury of the resident is to have the choice to go into the hotel spaces and interact with visitors, et cetera. But the idea that you have amenities with scale uh, that are private to residents is, is a big deal and an increasingly big deal, but it does always come back down to service. Mm -hmm. Because the stock and trade of any branded residential development is how great is the service, how anticipatory is it? And is it consistent with my brand expectations when I bought here? You have the most beautiful cognac lounge in the world, but if the service isn't there, yeah. what really are you paying for at the end of the day? And so it, it always comes down to that brand promise, I think. And how much do the residences, uh, resident people actually want to commingle with the hotel? Or <laughs> it's like maybe the gym, but what else really? I mean, because you kind of have to overbuild for, on both fronts, in many ways to accommodate both, but then do they want it or do they not? I think it, it's really funny. We have a lot of brands and we've noticed that the buyers and the profiles of each brand is very different. Mm -hmm. In addition, buyer is super social. Like, they yes. love being in the addition bar and in the, yeah. in, the, in the speakeasy and upstairs at the pool. Mm -hmm. And it's, 
they, they love, they are buying it right. to be living with the hotel yeah. and yes. you know, hobnobbing with the glamorous. On the other hand, when you look perhaps at a, maybe a, a Ritz Carlton buyer, they're a little bit more demure mm -hmm. and they appreciate kind of the not in your face it. glamour and glitz and, and so they're a little, it's a, just a different, it's a nuance, but it depends, and it depends certainly on the count, right? If there's 20 residences above a hotel versus 120, um, certainly, you know, the, the more there are in terms of units, there should be really dedicated amenities and facilities yes. um, for, for those residents. And I think this is where the right, the right product strategy comes into play. And so if you have a development site, um, you know, there are a wide range of brands, not all of which are exclusively, you know, fancy, you know, traditionally luxury brands. You have Hard Rock uh, doing branded residential. You have Thompson doing branded residential. Uh, and so, you know, there is a huge range of options out there for any developer um, with or without a hotel to send a signal to the market related to the vibe that you can enjoy when you buy a residence in this development. And so, you know, it may not be a Ritz-Carlton if, if, um, if the market is more urban and more social and younger. Um, it could be addition, it could be W, you know? And so it really depends on really what the right market niche is for the development strategy. And then you bring up a point about the, the Thompson and, you know, it's, it's boutique. Not necessarily luxury, some people might say it. So are we hitting a push point where we're gonna hit saturation or that luxury is kind of done and maybe we're gonna have the Porsche hotel or the Ferrari hotel next sure just because we we're out of brands? <laughs> I, I, I'm sure we will have all of that and, and more. Um, but what's really interesting to me is how many boutique brands, uh, lifestyle brands and luxury brands are star starting to get into branded residential. Not even hotel companies, but um, you mentioned car brands, Bentley, Aston Martin, you name it, South Florida's full of this stuff. But um, there are beauty brands and wellness brands that don't have a hotel operation or hotel business that are getting into this. And it's, it's an exciting diversification, um, I think partly in response to the fact that everybody now knows about branded residential and you see some of the same brands over and over again, I want something different. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to adapt as an industry to respond to that. Cool. Well, I think we are out of time, and I really want to thank all of you guys. And um, I, I had okay. more questions, and I'm sorry <laughs> that I didn't, get, didn't get, get to the audience, but thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Gloria.